Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Thank you for joining us, everyone. It is absolutely a pleasure to have you uh, le- allow us to spend part of your day with us, or allow us to spend part of our day with you, however I need to say that. I haven't found a good way to actually say that yet. We just appreciate it when you let us into your lives yes, for just a little do. while <laughs> during the day. We have a growing, continually growing number of people that, that join us sometimes once in a while, sometimes regularly. Uh, and it includes a vast number of people. Um, when I we did the last podcast on Thursday, I really expected some negative feedback from that, and I didn't get any. In fact, all of the feedback I got was absolutely positive, and we appreciate that as well. But you know, when I when I attack a tradition, it's dangerous territory because people like their traditions, and um, Going after those type of things, separating the truth from the fiction or the truth from the, uh, not always fiction, but semi-fiction, because there's always a grain of truth somewhere in the traditions, usually, it's not always uh, going to come out to be a positive thing. But, you know, we appreciate all the positive feedback and... uh, some of the comments that I had privately were really, really nice, and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. We have people listening from really uh, many walks of faith. Uh, there are Christians, of course, that listen to us. There are Jewish folks that listen to us. From time to time, there are Muslim folks that listen to us. And the reason I think all of these people come to something like I present or like we present is because we're not pushing tradition. People want to know what's in the Bible and how it applies to their lives today, right? Right. And that's what we're doing is just how do you apply what's in the, what's really in the Bible, not the, not the traditions and the doctrines, but what's in the Bible to how you live today. And that's what we're going to look at uh, in just a moment. Let me tell the folks who may be new, if you go to givegod90.com, uh, there's all kinds of things there. There's you know, I added a video page uh, a couple of months ago and uh, has some of our, I think, more interesting uh, teachings on there. Uh, and hopefully coming out within the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a new video <laughs> if we can get it done. I'd like to see it done, uh, but it takes time. It takes uh, a little bit of effort <laughs> on my part. <laughs> a lot of effort. <laughs> um, you know, because we're running kind of a, uh, you know, a two-force show here. So we're just kind of doing doing our thing. What we're going to look at today um, comes from, well, I'm going to take it from Matthew, but the same thing can be found in Mark. More on that in a few minutes. And typically, Christian pastors will present this about, they, well, they very just seldom use the Matthew portion that we're going to use. They will use the Mark portion. Um, But it's the same incident that's recorded in both. And when they take it from Mark, they want to make it about food and food alone. And the takeaway from that is incorrect. The tradition is because of some of the things that people have added to what's actually in Scripture 
uh, that Christians can eat anything in the world they want to eat. It doesn't matter. But what we're going to see is that's not the case here. There's something more important going on. <clears throat> now, when we think about trading traditions, uh, in, in modern times, it's easy for people to go from church to church to church to church, right? Looking for something. And we're going to incorporate that in what we talk about as well. Uh, you know, a couple of friends of ours, you know, they claim they're from the church of the church hoppers. They just go from place to place to place looking and searching until they found more, until they found something substantial, something that wasn't based on tradition, but it's actually based on scripture. What Yeshua attacks here is a couple of things. And as you read this, I hope, listen for what he is attacking. Uh, you know, when, when people talk about uh, the miracles, they leave out what he teaches. And what he teaches uh, is actually what brings about the miracles. So, as you read from Matthew 15, verses 1 through 20, then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves also break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother. And the one who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whosoever says to his father and mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or mother. And by this you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Your hypocrites rightly do. Did Isaiah prophesy about you by saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters the mouth that defies the person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles the person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were off, offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, Every plant which my father, heavenly father did not plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides of blind people. And if a person who is blind guides another who is blind, both will fall into a pit. The heart of man. Peter said to him, Explain this, the parable to us. Jesus said, Are you also still lacking in understanding? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and those things defile the person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimony, and slanderous statements. These are the things that defile the person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the person. Okay. You know, we, we read about Peter, everybody thinks, oh, poor Peter, how dumb could he be, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, are you that, Peter, because we read this and it's like, you know, Yeshua says, Peter, are you that stupid you don't get this? But Peter is, is one of the ones who is willing to say, look, I, I like things broken down into the easiest way to understand this. Explain it to me, right? You know, it's, it's kind of like the old Ricky Ricardo thing. You know, when you lose the, you've got some explaining to do, right? <laughs> right. And, and he does. He breaks it down and he says, look, here's the way it works. As I said, the same incident is recorded in uh, Mark chapter 7. 
And everybody will tell you that this is when Jesus said you can eat anything you want to eat. It doesn't matter. In fact, uh, in parentheses in some Bibles, it says, thus declaring all foods clean, right? Right. Um, so that means that we could eat shrimp and pork and oysters, bear, mountain lion, dog, cat, rat. Even cannibalism is okay, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. <clears throat> um, number one, if he would have said this, he would have been violating what Moses had written. And that's what he's not doing here. He's telling the Pharisees, you know, your traditions of men don't count, right? <laughs> this... This thing includes what Matthew writes and records. Is, it includes something that, that Mark doesn't. Uh, to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the person. That's what Peter was asking. Look, explain this to us. You just said a whole lot of things. Explain it to us. And it boils down to to eat with unwashed hands does not defile you. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? The, this passage contains actually two very important lessons. How a person defiles oneself and how following the uh, how important it is to follow the instructions from the Creator as opposed to following the traditions that we make up for ourselves. And then we consider those traditions as Scripture. He quotes Isaiah here, so let's look at where Isaiah comes from. It's actually 29, verses 13 and 14, and this is, this is interesting. Listen carefully. The Lord says, These people say they love me. They show honor to me with words, but their hearts are far from me. The honor they show me is nothing but human rules they have memorized. So I will continue to amaze these people by doing more and more miracles. Their wise men will lose their wisdom. Their wise men will not be able to understand. Okay. My confession for the day is I've not been to seminary, which is probably a good thing. Because I have the ability, I have the freedom, I am not restricted by seminary teaching. I can read this and I can say, oh, guess what? Some of these miracles may be that the plain people are able to look at Scripture and, and know exactly uh, what it means, where the wise men will be foolish and they can't see it because they have been indoctrinated, they have been taught, they have been trained, and they have been conditioned to only repeat what comes from their teachers. They only repeat what they've been taught because they're not wise enough to open the book and read it for themselves. That's scary. I know a lot of pastors who use uh, different tools to develop sermons. And most of the time, all they do is copy and paste different parts of different sermons into what they want to say. Right? That, that's, that's just being foolish. That's just, that leads to all kinds of bad stuff. Is there any wonder there's 43,000 different Christian denominations in the world? You know, you got all these people going their own way. It, it's absolutely nuts. You know, we've been in churches that are, are nothing more than human rules, and they haven't even memorized them. They have to read them out of a book, right? We... <laughs> It, it, it's amazing when you get, when you walk into these places and they don't even know their own doctrine. They have to read it. They don't even know their own worship service. They have to read it. They have to follow a book to know what they're doing. That's just sad. The Almighty, you know, he provides instructions and it's pretty simple and pretty easy. We've seen firsthand what it is for, uh, for the wise to be foolish and not understand. We've seen the blind leading the blind and falling into the traps that they've already laid for themselves. You know, we've heard people say, well, it really doesn't say this in the Bible, but we believe. Well, why would you believe 
something that's not in the Bible if you claim to believe the Bible. Because we have traded the instructions of our Creator who designed us to live His way for the tradition of men because you want to live the way you want to live. You want to live for yourself and not for the one who created you. Breaking those traditions of man and returning to doing what we're designed to do is really what draws many, many people to examine their Hebrew roots of the faith. Now, I need to be careful here that I didn't say Jewish roots, right? Mm -hmm. Because before the tribe of Judah, uh, before they became dominant, the, the dominant tribe, and the northern tribe split away because of the sins of Solomon, even before David or Saul was anointed king, our creator was king over Israel. Okay? The worship doctrines that he established is what they're searching for. They're looking to get back to doing what the Almighty asked them to do. But because they've been so conditioned to following traditions, what they what they wind up doing is actually going from you know this denomination to this denomination. They're trading tradition. They're trading one tradition one set of man-made traditions for another set of man-made traditions. It doesn't matter whether they go from like the Methodist to the Baptist to the Lutheran. It doesn't matter what order they go in. But they are trading one set of traditions for another set of traditions until they say, what's this strange group over here? You know, they're, they're talking about obedience. They're talking about actually doing what God said to do. They're talking about living the way he designed us to live. That that sounds foreign to me. <laughs> because I'm so used to, oh, all I have to do is this and I'll be okay. All I have to do is that and I'll be okay. Because the Creator's instructions are often missing or they've been perverted to something unrecognized even by the Creator, they're missing uh, altogether. Those things that the Almighty has said do can't be found in many churches. They can't be found in many houses of worship, no matter what denomination. People are beginning to wake up and realize that the blind and foolish wise men of their denominations are leading them into a pit. One of the miracles I think the Almighty is... is doing that's mentioned in Isaiah is he is actually opening the eyes of the blind and not those people who are left in the dark and can't see physically, right? I'm talking about opening the eyes of the people who have been blindly following traditions all their lives. Often, many of these people are doing this after many, many years of sitting in various houses of worship, listening to tradition after tradition after tradition, wondering why they're not witnessing other miracles, Wonder, wondering why they're not seeing the healing that they're asking for, wondering why they're not seeing uh, you know, the, the, these souls. I don't know if I want to use the word coming to salvation, but actually coming to faith would probably be a better way to say that. Why aren't more people seeing what we're seeing? It's because they're caught up in their traditions. They're not seeing Scripture for what it is. What these folks are searching for, what draws them is their spirit is stirring something in them to find the truth. And it's not just the little bits and pieces that are mixed in with the traditions. It's not just the little bits and pieces of the truth that are mixed in with those feel-good messages or there's prosperity things that you, you hear about, you know, name it and claim it type things from some famous TV people. What they're looking for, what, what they're craving is evidence of their faith. What they're looking for is some foundational truth that they can't find now, regular listeners have heard me say many times that I've heard that the doctrines of my denomination are based on Scripture. 
um, my answer may hurt your feelings when I say, well, the doctrines of the Satanic Temple are also based on Scripture. Actually, the doctrine of the Luciferians are based on one mistranslated word of Scripture. And if your doctrines are based in Scripture, but you're doing your own traditions, then it, chances are you have twisted and perverted the very thing you claim to follow to suit the way you choose to live. Matthew 15 and Mark 7 aren't about food. The dietary laws were never changed. They are still, I don't want to use the word enforced, but they're suggested. You know, the dietary regulations we see are meant to guide us into a healthy, long, productive lifestyle. They're not designed to regulate someone to the point where if I'm starving to death, I can't eat a ham sandwich. That's not what they're there for. Survival and continuation of life always uh, are maintained primarily for the benefit of, of humanity. But it is a guide to say, here is the way the Almighty wants you to live. If you live this way, if you follow these instructions, you'll be healthier. And the people who do that have typically found out they are healthier, right? Right, they have. I mean, it's not rocket science to know if you don't feel good and you cut certain things out of your diet and you feel better, chances are those things were bad for you. That's right. You know, it, it's, you know, today people are perfectly happy to give up peanuts, right? Because, mm -hmm. oh, you know, so-and-so in my family is allergic to peanuts, so I don't have any of that around my house. Right. But you tell them they can't have a ham sandwich and they get belligerent. I mean, it's like, I'll eat whatever I want to eat. Well, you don't, you're not eating peanuts. Mm -hmm. You're not eating whatever you want to eat. <laughs> you're eating what makes somebody who doesn't even live in your house but visits there healthy. Why don't you do something for yourself? Make yourself healthy. Give up something that you like for what the Almighty is saying isn't good for you to start with. <clears throat> I'll come down off of that soapbox for a moment. <laughs> now i got to find where I was in my notes. When when Yeshua was chastising the Pharisees, uh, he said, But you say, whoever says to their father and mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father and mother. And by this you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. They were actually teaching people to give to the temple instead of taking care of their parents. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. Does it make any sense today what the pastors are teaching their congregants? No. You know, you've got to give us before you or give to us before you give to anybody else. We come, the church comes first. I have heard that over and over and over in churches. Got to give them your 10%. Got to give them your 10%. Guess what? You don't got to give them your 10%. <laughs> okay? okay. The, the modern churches are not the temple. Let me say that again. The modern church is not the temple. Many of these churches that want to say the law is done away with and then say, oh, but you've got to give your 10%, just like it says. Right. It's all in there together. There's no difference between what we're doing, to what the modern, many of the modern churches today are doing and what the Pharisees were being chastised for in this very verse. Okay? 2,000 years ago, and preachers today are exactly the same. The Pharisees 2,000 years ago were saying, you have to give to us before you take care of mom and dad. Because if you give it to us, it's just like giving it to God. Right? <laughs> We've heard that. <laughs> we have heard that come out of the pulpit in a few churches. Mm -hmm. you got to give to us. But giving to the church is just like giving to God. No, it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Now, if you're a member of the church, and I, I, I say this in uh, God's Universe, God's Rules, if you are a member of a church, and that church owns or leases a building, and you're part of that, then yes, you have a responsibility to, to help pay for that, whether it's the electric bill or the lease or whatever it might be, simply because you're part of a group. You have agreed to do something, to be part of that group, right? Right. So it's your responsibility. 
Does that mean you have to give your 10%? No, it means you give what you are able to give to help them meet their demands. But to say you've got to give 10% is not correct. There's no set standard of what you give to a modern church. It's that simple. Because the modern church is not the temple. You want me to say that again? The modern church is not the temple. You don't have to do that. Too many churches are willing to take your money. And then, when you might need a little something, they don't want to help you. We've seen that too. Mm, we have. People who have gone to the same church year after year after year after year, they give and they give and they give and they give, and then they get in a little financial bind. Now, all of a sudden, the church, you know, what do you mean you're coming to us for help? We can't afford to help you. We've given all the money to somebody else. And often what they give the money to is somebody or some cause where they think they're going to get some notoriety, right? Mm, Yes. Um, In in the area we live, every beginning at Thanksgiving through the end of the year, there is a charity drive from one of the local television stations. And it amazes me. It amazes me. Now, they announce on television during their news broadcast who gives money to them, who gives a large amount of money to them, right? I think it's over $1,000. You'd be amazed at the number of churches that give over $1,000 to this other charity so that they can get their name read on television. That's what they're giving it for. They want the notoriety. But they refuse to turn around and help the members of their own congregation. We recently... Uh, learned of a church not terribly far, about an hour's drive from us. An elderly couple couple lived next door. Now, they lived next door to this church for a long time. And as they got older and got older, you know, they, they retired and they were keeping their yard really, really nice. And, you know, some of the uh, members of the church realized that you know, their grass didn't cut and their shrubs are getting nasty looking. The shutters are falling off their house. Man, you know, I don't know what's going on over there. But, ah, we we got to do something about that grass not being cut. They're in violation of the county ordinance about grass. And instead of going over and knocking on the door and saying, you know, how can we help you? Now, these people didn't go to that church, okay? But instead of going over and knocking on the door and saying, you know, we noticed your grass needs money. Can our youth group come cut your grass? Give them something to do. Can some of the folks who are handy with the church, you know, put the shutter back on your house, help make make it look nice and neat and tidy? You always kept it nice. You know, can we help you? No, they didn't do that. They picked up the telephone and called the county regulators and said, can you send somebody out and find these people because they didn't mow the grass? Now, is that uh, doing, you know, is that loving your neighbor? Mm-hmm. Is that being a good neighbor? Is that uh, doing the things that they claim they are called to do? Not in my book, it's not. I mean, that's just the opposite. You know, <sighs> they didn't treat others the way they wanted to be treated. Let's just, let's just put it that way. You know, that's following the doctrines of man and not the instructions that we have been given by the Almighty. When we allow... Greed and lust and murder or other evil, you know, maybe even selfishness or self-centeredness to influence our lives, we are dangerously close to removing our name from that book of life that the Almighty holds in his right hand. I'm not exactly sure you want to do that. Hmm. No one else can remove your name from that book. Only you have the authority to erase your name from the book of life. You start out in it. Your actions are what either keeps it in it or takes it out. It's that simple. It's that easy to understand. What you do affects whether your name's in the book or not in the book. What you do affects what is mentioned that are in the other books. When we choose to do the things, our do things our way and not his way, 
we put ourselves above the one that created us. When we do things our way, we and say, you know, well, I'm doing it for the Lord. I don't know how many times I've heard that. That I've heard that. I'm doing it for the Lord. No, you're doing it for you. It's that simple. You're doing it for yourself. And when you say, when you're doing it for yourself, for your own notoriety, but you claim, I'm doing it for the glory of the Lord. No, you're doing it for your own glory. You're putting yourself above the Almighty. You're twisting and perverting the things He said. You're no better than the very first one who said, I can do this better. And Christians, you know who I'm talking about. This is probably the biggest reason that causes people to move from church to church to church. Why they search. They see these things happening. They look around and they and they say, well, you know, this family over here, they've fallen on some hard times. They need some help, but the church isn't helping them. Why not? You know, I, I've given money to this church. Am I going to wind up, could I wind up in the same situation? You know, I, I've... I've Spent like my my parents came here. I've come here all my life. I'm 65 years old, getting ready to retire. If I hit hit some hard times, I can't depend on my worship community to support me. If if I need it now, see that's what the church is supposed to be doing. It is supporting the ones who support themselves. That's what communities do. They're not designed to give all their money away for notoriety. People are moving around from church to church to church and pastors can't understand why. I can tell them why. You're not telling them the truth. You're not giving them the foundational truth straight from Scripture. You're teaching them traditions and saying this is the way that the Bible says to live and it's not. When Yeshua told the Pharisees, it is with an empty promise you teach your doctrines for the Almighty's commandment. You gain nothing from it. That comes out of Mark chapter 7, by the way. If you're looking for that, it's in Mark chapter 7. It is in vain that you teach your doctrines, your traditions for the commandments of the Almighty. That's why so many people move from church to church, trading tradition, this tradition, for that tradition, for that tradition. They're seeking, but they're having a hard time finding it until they realize there's this strange group out there who are actually living the way they're designed to live. There's this really weird bunch of people out there. Some of them call themselves Messianic. Some of them call themselves Hebrew Roots. Some of them, and you can find them in many, many communities now around the world. But they're actually going back and living according to Scripture, not according to that church doctrine or that church doctrine or those traditions. But they're actually walking in the way as it's described in so many places in the Bible here's where give God Nani might be able to help you if you're one of these people who are searching if you're one of these people who haven't figured it out yet you know if you go to givegodnani.com and just start doing the things that are outlined there it actually the first thing we teach is how to improve your communication with your creator how to have a better communication. How to how to talk and how to listen. <laughs> you know, it, it's not that it's not that difficult. You just have to be willing to give up your man made doctrines, and we do that just a little bit at a time, just little steps. You know, something you can do every day for a week until it becomes habit, and then we add to it, and then we add to it, and eventually you add to it because. Everybody's different. You know, we can only take you so far, and then you are the one who then, by the at the end of 90 days, should be able to see your life improve enough that you can continue to study, and you can continue then to actually 
understand what you need to do and find where it is written in Scripture what you need to do. And, of course, you can always come back and listen to the podcast because, you know, we talk about this stuff twice a week. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> you can actually learn to live the way you are designed to live by your Creator. It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. All you have to do is choose to do so. Okay? It's, it's that simple. It's that easy. And you can do it. And it will improve your life and it will improve the lives of the people around you. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? It's a bright, sunshiny day here today, and thank you for joining us. That's right, everyone. It is actually, the sun is actually shining today. Uh, it has been a wet winter for us here where we live, but it's drying out. Until Thursday, where we look at Psalm 16, we wish each and every one of you many, many blessings. Oh, my God.